uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I am at the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma, and I'm a psychologist, but I've been working with journalists as for part of my career, probably now for 20, 25 years. And this is our, um, our website. We have some resources in Ukrainian. Um, so I wanted to let you know that. My approach today, and I know we have an audience that's um, very broad, is I'm going to assume that, that the, I'm going to speak mostly to Ukrainian clinicians. That is my assumption. Um, and I'm, I'm going to emphasize the things that you might want to know that might be helpful in supporting um, Ukrainian journalists. Um, some of what I, I'm going to speak about applies to all journalists covering war, including uh, foreign correspondents who are there. Some of it applies to covering sexual assault and those kinds of things. My plan is to do a very abbreviated background on journalists and trauma, again, emphasizing the things that I think are most relevant to your situation. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is a journalist, what are the kinds of issues they face so you can understand the context. I'm going to talk a little bit about challenges and threats. Um, and I'm going to review a tiny fraction of the literature on mental health and stress among journalists, again, focusing on what makes sense here. Um, some of what I say is an oversimplification. I'm just going to tell you that now. I'm making large generalities um, in the effort of covering a lot in a short time. And then what I want to focus on is what are some things to keep in mind in offering support to your Ukrainian colleagues, journalists, both now and in the future. And so that is sort of my framework for today. So I do want to say I consider myself a journalist ally, and I believe that we need healthy journalists. Healthy journalists could be that you have a healthy profession, just like for us as clinicians. If you have healthy journalists, you have a healthy democracy. If you have healthy journalism, you have press freedom. Oops, let me go back. Um, trauma silences certain issues and silences uh, journalism. So I do see trauma work as a press freedom issue. Um, I also believe that the more informed journalists are about trauma, the better that they can cover all sorts of things. They can tell better stories, they can make better news choices, they can be more sensitive and ethical. And I'm gonna focus a little less on that aspect of things today, but I do want you to be aware of that. So what is a journalist? Uh, we have a colleague, Arnold Isaacs, who's retired now, who says a journalist, and he says that he's a war correspondent, he says it in a gruffy voice, a journalist is someone who finds out stuff and tells people about it. And so that's a very large group. It could be a reporter, it could be a photographer, it could be an editor, it could be a producer, it could be a fact checker, it could be a manager. There are lots of types of journalists. And internationally um, and within countries, there's no universal academic or professional credential. Some people have formal training, some people have on-the-job training. It really varies. It can be full-time, part-time, or freelance. And it can also include citizen journalists, bloggers, if working consistently within professional norms. So again, this is a wide group of people. And I just want to point out that what I'm saying um, might be different for different groups. The other thing is I think much like clinical work, journalism is a professional identity. Lyra McKee said, for the first time in your life, you'll feel like you're good at something. You'll have found your calling. You'll meet amazing people. And when the bad times come again, FYI, your first girlfriend is not the one and you screw up that history exam, it will be journalism that helps you soldier on. Journalism is personal. It's the calling. And I think it's very important to understand that because that makes a difference in clinical work. The other assumption I'm gonna to make today is I'm going to assume from the start that journalists are moral and committed to truthful reporting and that they're following their professional code. So I wanna talk a little bit about the ethics because just like in the field of clinical work, ethics are what make journalism a profession. In most cases, and again, there are always exceptions and they're, they're journalists who aren't ethical, but if they're following an ethical code, 
the ethical commitments and aspirations are being accurate, being factual. And when you're not being factual and giving an opinion, staying so. Providing information in timely fashion, being fair, being independent and impartial, just like clinicians don't have dual roles, journalists believe in separating those kinds of things. So I also do a lot of disaster mental health. Um, and when we do drills, often uh, in our context, um, we have one group of journalists participating in drills to help us figure out how, where would we put if there was a disaster, where would we put the journalists, and then someone else covering that event from the same news agency so that there's both that separation. They um, look towards compelling stories and images, holding power accountable, and minimizing harm and risk to vulnerable sources. So they're not always trained in that ladder. There are lots of tensions that come up from this. There's time pressures, there's competition, there's a desire for sensitivity, but also needing to get things quickly. There's concern about getting it wrong or being manipulated by sources. There are editorial decisions sometimes that are beyond a journalist's control. And all of these are important because they can, these ethical conflicts can produce moral distress. And we're finding out more and more that ethics and moral distress are things that um, affect journalists' mental health. There are all kinds of journalists, like I said before, but I want to focus a little bit on what's unique about local journalists, because many of the folks that I think that you might interact with and want to help with are your neighbors. They're local journalists. They aren't co war correspondents who were assigned to come to a different community. They are people living in a community that was attacked and that are now responding. And so they're covering their own community in a way that's uniquely accountable and vulnerable, just as you, many of you are living in your own community doing that. They're facing escalating threat, physical, uh, in real time, and online abuse, as you know. And um, very few have had training for safety and security. And there are a number of groups that are providing um, uh, safety, uh, personal protective equipment, working to fundraise, working to provide these trainings for journalists. But many local journalists did not have this uh, early in February. Most local newsrooms are under-resourced um, where there isn't training. And then there's the everyday stuff that I'm not gonna focus on now. The other thing I wanna point is that photographers and videographers are very different from people who are working with words. They're often first on the scene. That doesn't apply as much here. But the advice is if your pictures aren't good enough, it means you're not close enough. So there is some, um, they need to be closer most of the time. Um, they have to repeatedly review and edit distressing images. And there may be a different way in which that affects the brain. They often feel underappreciated by reporters or editors. And they have less opportunity to to tell stories or frame their images. Often they give their images and they get framed by other people. And I think many of you have seen this. This is an example of uh, not a problematic one, but this viral image was taken uh, in Poland. And I think many of you are familiar with it. it. It went across the world, but this image was used again and again to talk about some of the issues of um, leaving. The next point I want to make is that covering war is very complicated for a journalist. Uh, many times they talk about the fog of war, that it's hard to get accurate information. There's security, there's logistics, there's curfews, there's checkpoints. I think many of you are familiar with this. And social media is both a great thing because it provides lots of input, but it's hard. You have to verify it. There's information and misinformation with it. And um, for those of you, who are interested, particularly, I think, outside of Ukraine, this uh, Stop Fake Org website is a very helpful website um, that looks at verification of information um, uh, housed in, in Ukraine and focused on Ukraine news, what's true and what isn't. So I wanted to mention that. So what's unique about Ukrainian journalists 
is that, again, they're covering their own community. I've talked already about not having safety equipment. Um, I think there's a larger range of practice experience and training in terms of covering war. And as many of you may know, you know, there's an ongoing tension with media platforms owned by oligarchs. So the degree of independence, while uh, your the constitution assures freedom of the press, what that means in terms of legal protections barely varies. It's not as strong um, as it could be. So there's a lot of dangers there. And you've all been living with Russian uh, misinformation campaigns since 214, if not earlier. So Ukrainian journalists have their own unique um, obstacles. Um, so I, that's sort of just a big framework on just thinking about the culture of journalists and the key things that I think that are important to keep in mind in thinking about, well, how can I, from my clinical hat, be most helpful? Now I wanna move on to trauma and its impact on journalists. And there's a large literature, I'm not gonna go over all of it. It has a lot of methodological issues there. Um, we talk about PTSD and secondary trauma and vicarious trauma all in the same way. And I think there are differences between directly and indirectly being exposed. Um, a lot of it is cross-sectional and retrospective and not perspective. Um, there's a lot of convenient samples with poor response rates. Um, the organizational and the clinical literatures are just starting to come together. So there are problems with it, but there are very clear patterns emerging from the literature and the strengths of the literature are they're interdisciplinary, they are mixed method, they are across multiple countries. So there's a lot to learn there. And um, we do have a research database for those of you who are interested. Um, in research at Start Center, um, where you can access the academic and scholarly literature. So I'm going to simplify that and focus on the things that I think are most important. So first of all, there are all sorts of potentially traumatic events that journalists face. Um, and this is just a more general thing to be thinking about. There's the direct ones and the indirect ones. And this is a list of some general ones but I want you thinking that not only are people directly in the line of fire and directly assaulted, but they're also documenting survivors, listening to grief, talking to people, and they are professional witnesses to the pain, right? So they're both interacting with other people and they're exposed. So there's a double sort of dosage here of what people are experiencing. Um, there are all sorts of stressors that have nothing to do with the war. How do you report on multiple platforms, deadlines, shift work, changing schedules, public critiques, um, desires to be perfect, supervisor uh, criticisms, um, concerns about the work. There are all sorts of just those regular things. And I think that one of the, some of the bigger issues for Ukrainian journalists right now are framing their own work. Am I a journalist or am I a patriot? Should I be fighting? Should I be doing this work? What's its meaning? The issue of should I be reporting critically or skeptically or not, given the current situation, is a real ethical dilemma. And what I think we will see in the future is that journalists are being enlisted to document war crimes um, for future needs and they have no training. And this is going to be an ongoing issue, I believe, um, in living with sort of using their work in dual roles. And so these are things I wanna encourage you to keep an eye on because I think these are dilemmas that are going to be clinical issues, perhaps, um, and things to be thinking about. The biggest thing I wanna say, however, is that journalists are resilient. They are incredibly resilient. And that's what the data shows, that most journalists exhibit resilience despite repeated exposure to catastrophic events. And I would actually argue that Ukrainian journalists are very resilient. Um, because when I was doing some training with Ukrainian journalists in 2018, I was so amazed by the resilience of journalists working under difficult conditions in 218. Um, I wanted to understand more. It is very hard in what I would say in, 
in communities where media law is just coming up to work. And journalists were just, I was blown away by the incredible work that people were doing. So um, with the help of colleagues at IREX, a student, Pauline Diamond my, and myself, we decided that we wanted to look at Ukrainian journalists and their resiliency. So I was smack in the middle of data collection when in the middle of February this year. Um, so we got only a little bit of data because we weren't there. And so I'd love to be able to publish even this tiny bit. Um, it, it doesn't make sense to be getting more data, but the preliminary data from 37 respondents was very consistent with what I observed. While on symptom checklists, 78% had high levels that would meet, and this is a self-report list, not a diagnosis, but for symptoms, they would meet probable diagnosis. There was not any evidence on burnout measures that they were burnt out, and there wasn't very much evidence at all. In fact, 71% said the work was worth the effort on a measure. So what we found was that yes, people had a lot of symptoms, and this was in February, this was from December to February, and they had a lot of trauma exposure. <clears throat> Their work was not burning them out. And I think this speaks to something very important, which is meaningful work does appear to be something that keeps people resilient. And I think that's something that I want to emphasize in that that's very important for us to be thinking about. Um, and this was again, I want to say before February. And I think that should shape the way we think about things. So the, in terms of the literature on, on post-traumatic stress disorder, um, the prevalence study is very widely, depending on their methodology, but journalists across the world are exposed to very high rates of trauma. And it, it runs the gamut as to how many have PTSD in terms of uh, measures. Uh, but there clearly is a relationship. The way I read it is that journalists, again, are resilient given that they've exposed at very high rates. Um, but um, it is an occupational threat, but again, resilience seems to be there. <coughs> and we need to focus also at the subclinical level, not looking at disorders, but looking at the problems or the traumatic reactions. And again, when I talk with journalists, and I think John is gonna talk about this, I actually don't even talk very much about PTSD. I talk about reactions. We all have trauma reactions and we need to learn how to manage those. And I think that's very important. So uh, PTSD is relevant. It's an occupational risk. It is not the most, uh, it is, journalists are both resilient and vulnerable. That's what I wanna say. <coughs> and that's just um, one example, excuse me, one minute of some surveys about rates for the past month. Okay. <clears throat> there are a lot of predictors of trauma reactions or PTSD in journalists. And most of them are very similar to what we know about PTSD in general. So I'm not going to focus on those in a lot of detail. Um, the only, I'm only going to review the important ones that I think are important for thinking about your practice. One major difference is that gender, usually in the larger PTSD literature, uh, women are more vulnerable to, to trauma reactions than men. You don't find that among journalists. There isn't a gender effect. Don't worry so much about what's written on the side. In my research lab with my students, one of the things that we're finding is it isn't trauma by itself that seems to be a predictor of PTSD. It's trauma in the context of the lack of organizational support. And that's also seen in some other studies. It is both being exposed and not feeling supported by your news organization if you have a news organization. So it's something about that combination and this speaks to, again, thinking very importantly clinically, how do we provide organizational support? How do we think about what are the ways that we can help in terms of thinking about those things? There are a whole lot of protective factors that are 
is what we know. But again, many of the protective factors that we're finding have to do with social support generally, have to do with management support, and professional identity, that purpose and mission. So again, I just want to emphasize that this issue of mission, support, and organizational support are really important in identity. The other thing that we have found that's really important and I think unique in the presentation of trauma reactions is the issue of guilt and the issue of ethics. Um, when we look at journalists, what we find, and we know this across the board that guilt may start or maintain PTSD in general. There's been a lot of sort of literature on that and that it's difficult to treat um, and there are some treatments for it. But specifically among journalists, it seems to have a unique contribution to PTSD just as in the other literature. And it's guilt about I'm benefiting when other people are suffering. I get prestige when I'm talking about the suffering of others. That's a constant issue. There are those ethical dilemmas such as my duty as a news gatherer and my duty as a moral human being when those conflict. Fear of causing additional harm to survivors. Concerns about the aftermath of the aftermath of coverage. And I've also yesterday I was talking to journalists who had just covered um, two mass shootings in the US. There's often guilt about not about about taking breaks and having boundaries. If I don't continue to cover this, then one of my colleagues is going to have to cover this. So even taking breaks that are needed for self care can be an issue and something people feel guilty about. And the other thing I want to emphasize that I think is especially important for journalists is that there's a lot of stigma about mental health. We are not a group um, that necessarily people trust. Um, they are concerned, particularly because the industry is having so much difficulty about losing credibility if they admit that they're having some trouble and they're afraid that that will get back to their jobs. So these are all sort of some obstacles and some things to think about. Okay, so that's my summary very quickly of sort of a very large literature of some key things. So now I wanna focus on, okay, what can clinicians do to help Ukrainian journalists now? Um, as you all know, we are not post anything. You are in the middle of some horrible situations and constant trauma. And again, I know it, it, it depends on where you're living, et cetera, et cetera, but this is not post, this is during. And traditional therapy is likely not appropriate at this point. Of course, you need stabilization for some people, and that goes without saying, but I think that as clinicians, we need to be thinking about consultation and support. And I think we need to be leaning on our military-based colleagues how do you help soldiers in the field? Because you are all right now soldiers in the field, right? You are, you need enough support to keep going on. You need to figure out what are the short-term strategies. And in the future, I do think there are traditional therapy that needs to be adapted to journalists. And I think we need to also be thinking about, hopefully we'll be there soon, um, society building and how journalism can have an impact and help with mission. There are many ways I think that we can be thinking therapeutically in the future, but right now we need to be thinking what will be helpful. And I'm so glad that I, I came after uh, Stephen Hobfall's presentation last month um, because, you know, there are five principles about psychological first aid. What do you need immediately after? Now it's again in the acute hours, promoting safety, promoting calming, promoting efficacy, and promoting connection and hope. These are also things that can be done now in the midst. And so that's a principle that I think is important. The other principle that I use to help journalists specifically is I now believe that I need to frame self-care as an ethical and professional imperative, not as a mental health imperative. And to use tips and solutions that fit within the journalistic framework. To tell a journalist to not watch the news is not helpful. 
what we need to be saying is how we need to take, I guess I would say a, um, the word is not coming to me, a prevent, a, um, a, a risk reduction approach. You need to watch the news. Let's talk about when do you do that? How much do you need to really watch the news versus when are you doing it because you can't stop yourself? What time of the day? We shouldn't be doom scrolling before bedtime and talking about reasonable ways to help people. I said before, I focus on the stress response, not PTSD per se, so that the, I don't need to talk about pathology and scary clinical terms. I want to talk about, we all have stress reactions. How do we manage them so that we can do our jobs better, which serves to destigmatize. And then focusing on what makes you resilient. What makes you continue to be able to focus? And I'll just give you a few examples. And I think John is gonna talk more about this in a few minutes. This is a slide that I often use with journalists. I talk about the stress response beforehand. And then I talk about here are some things um, where damage is, is the worst. When the stress never stops, okay, you're all there. You can't do that. You can't, we can't change this. But what we can change is either we, we can focus on the inability to adjust to stress or to shut off the stress response. So let's talk about some things that we can do to help us adjust to stress or turn off the stress response. So taking a break, breathing, meditation, all of those things will lower the stress response. And those are things people can do in five minutes and then go back to work. So really talking to journalists about what we really know biologically in very simple ways, I think is very helpful. You can take a deep breath between things. You can do a few things like that. So again, John will talk more, I think, about this. But I talk very realistically about we've all been stressed, maybe not as stressed as you are right now. How do you know you're stressed? How does your partner know when you're stressed if you don't? In the past, when you went through a hard time, what really helped you and what didn't? And do a little bit more of what you thought was useful for you. Do a little less of what wasn't so helpful. How do you lower that arousal in the moment? Breathe, exercise, meditation, prayer, whatever it is. Substance abuse is, is fine in, with limitations. Limit substance use if it's getting in your way and think about that. Staying connected. I showed you the data about social support. How do you actively maintain positive collegial uh, connections and peer support? And in the time of COVID, this is even harder, but how do you continue to stay engaged with your colleagues? And I think this is really important. Again, the, one of the reasons I'm so honored to be here with this network is I think this network also does that for you folks. It gives you a way of staying connected. Some of you are not all in the same place, you're dispersed. These networks are so important for all of our mental health and all of our connections. Connections are so important. And they're, I think, such an important part of uh, Ukrainian values. Family and partner support, and then sleep. Sleep is, is as much as you can sleep, we all know sleep is so important and more and more studies are looking at that. So these are the kinds of things that I focus on. I also just think as a citizen, one of the things that you can do that can really help journalists is that you can promote community. You can compliment good coverage when you see it. You can send an email saying, I really appreciate you wrote about this. Journalists get complaints after complaint but when they do something well, no one ever says good job or seldom says that. It's a way that you can support your fellow citizens. It promotes community. It promotes that sense of accomplishment and meaning. It promotes hope and it promotes people there. That is a small step that you can take without ever actually calling uh, or seeing someone clinically. And it goes such a long way. So, um, I'm not going to talk that much about future interventions, but I do think traditional treatments for PTSD and depression will be important 
But the things, again, that I would focus is on is the mission, the journalistic mission. And beforehand, we were just talking about how important the news is, right? You all tune into the news for your safety, for information, the importance of the meaning of these events. And I didn't talk about moral injury, um, and perhaps Jana might, that I think that's an issue that will be aware. And I flagged a couple of issues about patriot or journalist and ethical issues that I think may be important to keep an eye on as you develop practices. So to summarize, major things I wanted to say again are that journalists are incredibly resilient. There are unique issues and concerns to address. It's important for us as clinicians to adapt to journalist needs and to think about our practices that way. And for us to think about what is helpful now during an ongoing situation and the clinical tools we would use, and this is probably true for everybody, versus the future tools we would use. Um, if there are journalists who need specific help, there is a global forum for media development support that is mapping out all the needs of journalists, both technical or not. Um, a lot of work uh, was done to provide opportunities for journalists to leave, but nobody wanted to leave. So um, we're learning things like that. So instead, figuring out things like, how do you help people with disinformation, advocacy, training? Um, so there are lots of groups, international groups and local groups working together collaboratively in a network like this. Um, the DART Center has resources translated into Ukrainian. One of my favorites is more content oriented on uh, reporting on sexual violence and conflict. And sexual violence is an important um, issue now, I think, to be addressing. And I think I will stop there and turn it over to Jana. Thank you, Elana. Thank you for a uh, very touching and personal presentation. I felt as if you've prepared it for, for me personally, you know, for as uh, like as a for Ukrainian. But before we will switch to uh, Jana's presentation, I would like to highlight several things that uh, all the participants are very welcome to post uh, your questions or comments uh, in the chat. Uh, or you may raise your hand during discussion. And yeah, we, will, we, we would be happy to, to, uh, to have uh, several questions to Elana's presentation. Uh, but before you probably writing or Thinking about the question, uh, I would like to highlight uh, that uh, you, I will just right now post uh, in the chat uh, links for YouTube channels where you can find uh, previous video records of our meetings, either in Ukrainian or in English. And uh, uh, Alana was corresponding to the talk of Stephen Hopeful that we had uh, two weeks ago, and in a month we would have a presentation, an expert talk from Rakesh Jetli on moral injury and nicely how it corresponds. And, uh, and as well, we would have a meeting with uh, Joshua Morgenstein on the leadership and grief leadership. So if there are any comments or questions, Because uh, I know that we have here uh, a professional journalist like Tom Parkhill. Tom, maybe you want to comment? In fact, I'm not a professional journalist. I'm a, pre I'm a press officer. I'm the press officer for the ECNP. So I do work with journalists. And uh, it's very important, of course, that you communicate and the stories that you have to ECMP members, because I think lots of ECMP members don't really know how to access uh, information about what's happening in Ukraine, but also if we can to uh, communicate this information to a wider public in the West. Um, I'd be very, very happy if anybody has any, who wants to talk to me about uh, anything, just to drop me an email here and you can uh, maybe just put my email uh, available to to anybody who wants it. Um, 
because I'm, try I'm trying to put together a few interviews and, um, and to see whether or not there are other things that we can do that can help. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tom. Really, uh, at the ECNP uh, website, we have a specific page dedicated to Ukraine, and you would uh, you might uh, find there several interviews. One of them, recent interview, was with Professor Alek Chaban. Um, and Professor, uh, would you like to comment, or you would like to comment later during the discussion, Alex Zontovich? Um, I might as well do it now. Welcome, friends. Um, and I see Professor Zoha also welcome. I have a, um, a comment. Professionally, I quite often have to talk to the journalists and um, as a professional, I'm biased, is that I'm commenting and I'm observing at the same time. I'm looking at them uh, voluntarily or not. And uh, I have a lot of interest in that topic. My father was a good journalist, as I think. I see the problem of um, high rate of tra trauma among journalists. It's almost as traumatizing as being a doctor. Being a doctor myself, I know how exposed the doctor, the doctors are to this, the fact is. And there are two aspects. First, journalists as professionals uh, presupposes that these people have high humanitarian values. These people are crusaders with high aesthetic aspiration because they want to work with other people work with other human beings and consequently it leads to affiliation among the journalists um, journalists demonstrate high affiliation is that they want to be among the human beings or they want to be represented among humans and the um, technology allows them to affiliate that that millions are watching my reports and my stories However, these days, I think uh, journalists, specifically Ukrainian journalists, have faced a huge obstacles. And Ukrainian journalists are no exception. Same holds for American or the U journalists from the UK. Uh, the great Canadian theoretician Marshall McLuhan warned about this. It was his theoretical work back in the 1960s where he published this work. He said, uh, the, in the future, the society will only uh, assess visual information. Visuals will be all the messages that will be received. Therefore, the imagery will stand for the meaning of the message. And this is the trap the journalist ran into. Uh, people with high humanitarian values, they have very powerful calling for ascetism, and they're overwhelmed with visuals. Imagine such a person with these uh, needs and aspirations. It, this person is bound to be traumatized. And none of the brain evolution will protect you from putting together traumatic memories caused by the coverage. I think it's a global problem. It's not something pertaining to Ukraine only. During the 9-11 in the US, and this image was transmitted online globally, almost live. The same thing is happening right now. The rate of the grotesque is sky high now. Giving details of rapes, the number of victims and killed and graphic images of the corpses is a powerful exposure. Uh, the society is tra traumatized at large. And so are the journalists because they uh, are humane, uh, they cannot leave their humanity behind and are therefore impacted. My issue is, and my comment is that our journalists are on adrenaline cortisol rise, therefore they're insensitive to pain. Yesterday I was uh, seeing a patient at the Cardiology Institute in the city of Kiev. I'm in, based in Kiev at the moment. Um, and I'm going to say how it's linked with journalism. 
the patient says we saw a, a serviceman serviceman yesterday when uh, the serviceman was admitted uh, he had an infection but the infection started a month ago this uh, serviceman was uh, in active action but he didn't feel the infection at all but then after he recovered uh, it abruptly turned out that he has a, actually had a um, heart inf infection and this is something the journalists are facing increasingly uh, there's a lot of excitement, um, a lot of euphoria, a lot of sense of togetherness and cohesion. And people are bearing the burden. And I can only imagine how in the future we will be overwhelmed by throngs of people with PTSD because PTSD is post events because Ukraine is in the midst of the Great War. It's been ongoing for some time and uh, this Great War is lasting over three months. These people have been traumatized long ago. We worked with journalists a lot. Uh, one TV station uh, went to me, uh, and I'm working extensive with One Plus One TV channel. I really empathize, uh, and I'm partial to them. And I got this request. Uh, I need to screen the groups of journalists that went to the East. And that was back in 2015 and 2017. So when we started assessing them, I understand that the each and every journalist had an issues. Some of them had extensive PTSD to anxiety and depressive orders, uh, and they had elements of other problems as well. So what do you do? Do you stop the flow of information? Uh, it's a very broad question, and I do not know the answer. These people are extensively vulnerable and nobody is thinking of them. Nobody. Because they think that they're mechanical transmitters of events. You take a camera, you film it, you come and you go. So therefore, I have a lot of empathy, first and foremost, to what they do. I have an understanding that we need to find a way out. Uh, sorry, I spoke too much. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for bringing us a uh, uh, context, Ukrainian context. Uh, and actually, there is a uh, kind of comment, I would say, not, not a question, but uh, it could be uh, addressed by any, by Elana or Jana or uh, Oleg. So there is, a, uh, there is an issue that to be a journalist and to be a journalist in the country uh, at war, it's, it's the... Uh, injury of a different different level other other level and what do you think jana may talk about this as well but i think that's what i meant by that issue of um being a private citizen you know being a citizen am i a citizen first am i a journalist first where where does that lie how do i manage all those different identities um i think that's um, important. And I, I have a lot of reactions to um, the context just provided. Um, and I'm a little more optimistic. I do think that um, that PTSD, that that the, the mental health force needs to prepare. And that's why I'm so excited about sort of this network for lots of PTSD. But I also want to point out that people are resilient. Not everybody after war is broken. Um, and I guess that's one thing I just want to say again, I think both of those things are, are true, um, that we need to be prepared, but I also want to remind you that, um, unfortunately, we have lots of evidence that people survive war. That doesn't mean that we don't need to be prepared, because there will be a lot of mental health casualties, but there also will be a lot of um, strength. So I just want to, I want to say that again and turn it over to Jana, I guess. Yeah, I think this is a nice uh, place actually uh, uh, to talk about the self-help uh, for journalists. And let me uh, introduce our, our second speaker, uh, Jana uh, Javahishvili uh, from Georgia. Uh, Jana is a full professor of psychology at uh, Ilya State University at Tbilisi. And uh, she's a current president of of the Journey Agent Society of Psychotrauma. 
and she is a contact person for the DART Center of Journalism and Trauma in the South Caucasus. And uh, today, Jana will talk about self-care for Ukrainian media professionals because she, she, she does work with Ukrainian journalists for a long time. So please, Jana. Thank you very much, Irina. Uh, I will open my presentation. That's a huge honor to me to, to have this opportunity to, to speak at the meeting. Uh, participants of which are Ukrainian mental health professionals and Ukrainian journalists, and not only. So that's, that's just great. Actually, to, to be complimentary and um, yeah, uh, to synergize uh, Elana's presentation, wonderful presentation, very inspiring, and, and also uh, giving hope, giving a hope, especially uh, these figures of resilience are, are, are very hopeful. Uh, I would like just to say several stories accompanied by my slides. So the first story, oh, sorry, I did not open it properly. Yeah, forgot also to mention that uh, right now I, I am also representing that center Europe. So that's European branch of the um, uh, DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. Uh, I am board of trustees members of DCE as we call it. So the first story is about uh, cameraman. So uh, several years ago, I was listening to the interview of, of uh, one cameraman who was covering, actually he was deployed uh, and covering uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So he was speaking of his uh, PTSD story. And he was saying that uh, on the battlefield when he was covering atrocities, he was perfectly fine because he actually was um, secured or felt safe because of his camera. He was filming and he felt that, yeah, he's somehow uh, protected. And one day, his camera was broken. And that's how his personal defense against mental health problems also broken. So as soon as he, he was not able to perform his professional role, he developed PTSD symptoms because he was witnessing a lot of atrocities. And that's something which I call actually a paradox of journalism and trauma because profession of uh, journalists or media workers profession, media professional, that's a profession which has a chance in any complicated, difficult, um, adverse situation and circumstances uh, maintain uh, feeling or sense of having a mission and having purpose, which is very powerful protective factor. Um, against being traumatized. At the same time, uh, actually uh, covering adverse uh, situations, circumstances, stories, and atrocities, and especially war-related atrocities or human uh, man-made disaster-related uh, atrocities, uh, then you are exposed. And exposure to potentially traumatic experiences increases risks of traumatization. So that's about the journalist profession to be kind of unique, to be able to maintain your uh, mission and purpose, and at the same time to be exposed and to be at risk. Another story which I would like to uh, share with you, that, that's my story. Uh, back in 2014, I came to, to Ukraine for the first time in my life. Since then, I fall in love with your country. I came here together with my Georgian colleagues, psychotraumatologists. We were invited by the Ukrainian Psychiatrist Association and Dr. Simon Glusman, who asked us just to share experience of um, um, uh, our work with uh, traumatized individuals, um, um, families, communities, people, yeah, um, during war, after mass war. Uh, so, so we came in the middle of the Maidan crisis. Uh, the tents were still there, and that, that's one of the pictures that I took then. Uh, and um, I, we met 
wonderful group of uh, professional professionals. This was so-called uh, psychological service of Maidan and psychiatrists and psychologists were working there just, just as volunteers and trying to help people who were uh, in, in need of mental health care, but, but also families who lost their family members. We all know about Nibesna Sotnia. And they were saying that they feel helpless how to help the families who lost their family members because they, they cannot change anything and they cannot say anything um, uh, uh, which can actually be helpful at that moment. And I remember that uh, then uh, we conversated about cooperation with journalist community because journalists are, are, are um, Media professionals are the ones who, who can contribute to, to societal mourning. They can actually acknowledge the loss, help the public to acknowledge the loss, validate suffering of the families who lost family members, and memorize uh, uh, the victims while making stories about them. And uh, actually, uh, th that's um, about journalists contributing to public health in their own way. Uh, because journalists are those who can contribute a lot to fight stigma against mental health. Uh, so journalists somehow in their own way are contributing to public mental health, but mental health professionals are also contributing to um, well-being of journalists by fostering resilience. Uh, so this bridge between mental health professionals and journalists is so important, and that's what that center is about, actually. Uh, uh, another story which I would like to share with you, that story of me working together with my colleagues from the DART Center and uh, also um, uh, as a freelancer with the uh, Ukrainian media professionals. So the more focused work for me started with media professionals in 2016. And here this, this um, curve actually reflects my empirical observation about the demand for self-care training among journalists community. Uh, these projects um, were uh, and are facilitated by the DART Center on jo for Journalism and Trauma, by um, Rory Peck Trust, by Thomson Reuters Foundation, by Justice for Journalists. So there is a very good, uh, um, how would say, um, group of, of the organizations or the number of organizations, international organizations who are, who are taking care of journalist safety. Here, Elana was mentioning that there is not enough training, but there are organizations who are trying their best to provide both physical security training, but also mental health security, yeah. Uh, so my observation is that uh, starting from 2016, the demand for such work was on its rise. But uh, in 2002, all went sudden and that's very natural as Elana's study was stopped. Actually, uh, um, the events which were already planned in support of the journalists uh, were just canceled as soon as war started. And they were canceled and the demand just dropped down. And after uh, war started to develop and war atrocities were actually uh, uh, yeah, uh, going on in front of our eyes, uh, demand still started to, to, to rise. And there were some, um, for example, in April, mid-April, I, I um, conducted a training uh, on, on uh, demand of, uh, for uh, freelance journalists, Ukrainian journalists, on demand of the uh, Global Investigative Journalist Network. Uh, then again, uh, actually, um, uh, there were several requests, but again canceled uh, uh, very currently. One event actually by Thompson Reuters Foundation was uh, still held. Not many journalists attended it, not many media professionals attended it. So, and uh, when we were speaking about during the uh, webinar, what was going on, why the demand was not that high, uh, one of the media managers told, we are tired. And first of all, we need some rest. That was a very powerful formulation. He told, we are tired, we need some rest, we need, victory and peace. 
And I fully agree. Yes, we need victory, your victory and peace. We need, we do need it. At the same time, I, 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 I am recalling Bertolt Brecht's powerful uh, statement. The war is over, be afraid of peace. Yeah, that's about now it's luxury probably to 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 think about your mental health care in in, in, in war times in the middle of war. Um, it's perceived as luxury. It is not in fact, but it might be perceived as luxury. But after war, as um, uh, Mr. Chaban told, probably demand will rise, and we need to be prepared. Uh, here I would like to share with you uh, actually some reflections on the issues which were discussed uh, du uh, during the webinars which I conducted during uh, the war. So uh, that's about guilt and Elana mentioned guilt as an issue and, and guilt uh, of those who left for a safer place and, and feels guilty because some journalists are in, in, in uh, still in danger, yeah, colleagues, not some, many. Uh, survivor's guilt, but also guilt due to the fact that you are just covering, but are not able to help physically or materially, yeah? So that's about actually dilemmas which we face. And uh, this actually phenomenon reminds me very much uh, a very sad story of uh, Kevin Carter. Uh, who actually um, shoots the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning photo, uh, which, which was viral then. But he, he was exposed to huge criticism from the side of the opponents uh, because uh, he was blamed that he, instead of helping the child in Sudan who was starving, he just uh, and was actually uh, followed by a vulture. He just made a story out, out of it. And we know that the story actually ended tragically. Of course, that was not a direct um, cause of uh, suicide uh, uh, committed by Kevin Carter, but that somehow contributed, yeah. And, and therefore, I would like to stress that we always are speaking of PTSD symptoms or mental health symptoms, et cetera, but, but probably we need to, to address symptoms, we need to, to discuss dilemmas. And we need to reflect on the dilemmas. And this kind of reflective practices uh, during wartime and aftermath is of critically, uh, it's critically important. So another emotion which was articulated and uh, uh, during our webinars, uh, that's anger. And I consider that that's much more actually healthier to have anger during war. Probably that's, uh, yeah, um, than guilt. Uh, but still it needs to be managed, yeah? Uh, so we were speaking a lot about emotions, but also how to address mental health issues. Um, uh, own colleagues within the organization. So this how is it, it, it's important to be discussed also, how to speak about mental health problems, how to help yourself, how to um, support others, how to take care of your own staff if you are media, media manager, um, how to sensitize yourself, others. Yeah, so that's issues which need uh, to be discussed and uh, addressed. Uh, and issue which actually uh, Elana formulated as uh, being journalist versus being patriot, uh, but actually uh, um, I, I would I would call it how to be impartial, actually, and whether being partial means or not uh, being uh, less professional than others. So uh, actually, uh, am I good enough professional if I am? Uh, not able to be impartial in covering my own war. So that's also an issue which needs to be discussed, actually. Uh, and, and these uh, reflections should be encouraged and space and time found for these kind of reflections because they are having direct impact on mental health, actually. Because that's about my self-concept. Con am I good enough professional or not if I am not that impartial as uh, yeah, outside? There, let's say, yeah. So that's an issue. 
So what are relevant responses to this um, uh, um, <clears throat> diapason of problems? Uh, promote reflective practices, uh, defining and redefining professional boundaries. Professional boundaries need to be discussed. Um, yeah, because uh, all ethical dilemmas articulated this evening are, are related to ethical boundaries. Dealing with unhelpful thoughts, because guilt is uh, especially this paradoxical guilt um, uh, is, is about unhelpful thoughts. Foster emotional regulation. If we are speaking of anger, of course we need emotional regulation. Yeah, providing early detection or assuring early detection and early intervention in case when it's needed. So how we are going to address this? So reflecting on dilemmas, uh, discussing professional boundaries, and creating and finding time and space for this. This all needs not only actually goodwill, but also logistical arrangements and, and time, which is the most valuable resource. Identifying and altering unhelpful thoughts, uh, applying emotional regulation training, creating referral points, uh, because uh, some of us needs uh, more professional help, yeah? Uh, so uh, actually we can think or shape our strategies as system of uh, mental health care for media professionals. And here I would mention journalists informed mental health care. And this is something which actually Elana mentioned at the very beginning of her presentations that she is addressing mental health professionals who are attending our meeting and um, they need to be sensitized about journalism, about specifics of media profession, about specific uh, stressors that uh, journalists are exposed to, about specific moral issues and moral dilemmas. I am not going to cover here uh, moral injury issue, especially good that uh, you are going to touch upon it uh, in, in the uh, future webinars, Irina. Yeah, but uh, moral disentouchment or uh, how to say uh, moral mm, disappointment is an issue. In, uh, in media profession, yeah, for media professionals. So stress and trauma and mental health informed journalism also. So here we are having two actually um, bridging processes, let's say journalism informed mental health care and stress, trauma and mental health informed journalism. And uh, speaking of a system of mental health care for media professionals, what we are doing uh, we are doing actually more universal prevention interventions when we are doing self-care trainings or resilience building trainings or peer support trainings. Yeah, So that's about psychoeducation for media managers, for journalists, for media workers. Yeah, The second level, which, uh, which is also, uh, how would you say, uh, if we are uh, applying public health language, that's universal prevention uh, level, then we can speak of selective prevention level when we are promoting self-care, um, peer support um, uh, practices, tough care practices, yeah, between universal and selective. And then we can be more targeted and uh, use referral points and we can refer to non-specialized uh, support like uh, this could be emotional regulation training or that, that could be professional counseling actually also. As uh, Elana told, no full scale uh, psychotherapy, of course, uh, in more times there is no space for it and uh, it's not realistic uh, to aim to, um, but, but counseling is very important. Uh, and um, um, speaking of counseling, I, I would like to mention that Norwegian, that, that social capital is very important. And for example, a couple of weeks ago, Norwegian um, journalist, Dart, uh, Dart Network member journalist, Trond Idas, uh, wrote me a letter that Norwegian uh, Union of Journalists would like to help uh, Ukrainian journalists. And he was asking me about opportunities to provide online counseling, journalists informed online counseling. And actually we are working on that uh, before I will uh, come to do, do and don'ts, probably I will just show that uh, we organized actually uh, at the moment, uh, uh, some of them, 
dot ch some of them which, uh, website where uh, there is a psychoeducation information and um, there is a Facebook Telegram channel and, and probably uh, we are hoping that uh, we will um, provide uh, online counseling. Uh, right now, the group of uh, Ukrainian mental health professionals is uh, is um, uh, starting to be engaged in online counseling uh, project. So uh, we are very much hoping that at the end of this month we will be able to uh, to offer uh, to to the Ukrainian journalists in need uh, some uh, professional support as well. But Speaking of promoting uh, stress and trauma informed um, journalism uh, and journalism informed mental health care, uh, let's speak about do's and don'ts of mental health professionals. So as for do's, I will stress here informing for self-help, for uh, being sensitized, towards mental health problems, to recognize mental health problems, to, to, to know how to take care of yourself, how to uh, actually um, um, imply preventive uh, practices. So normalizing and destigmatizing, that's very important. Uh, yeah, speaking of uh, exposure, we, we need to remember that, yeah, journalists are resilient and, resilient and Elana's data are also confirming that equipping with particular emotional regulation skills, as Elana told, not rocket science, but breathing exercises, progressive muscles relaxation, which does not have any commands to relax, because during war time, my body would not listen to me and would not obey if I would command uh, relaxation. But progressive muscles relaxation is about tensing your muscles with breathing in and uh, releasing tension with uh, exhaling. So that's very um, efficient method to relax actually. So equipping and referring in case of need. So all we speak about is assisting in being resilient and providing, you know, system of mental health support uh, based on the needs. Uh, and what are don'ts then? Not to pathologize, not to psychiatrize, not to psychologize even, not to psychotherapize, and not to catastrophize. That's, that's what uh, I would like to, 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 uh, to, to, to leave as a take home messages. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jana. Thank you. Uh, I see that, uh, yeah, I'm mindful about the time because Ukraine is one hour ahead of Europe uh, and, and yeah, and Georgia as well, it's, it's, quite, it's quite late. So probably if we would have uh, one question or comment uh, in the chat or maybe one uh, question from, from the audience, that's, that's all that we could cover today. Unfortunately, but um, my impression that everything went so smoothly, and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, just just want to uh, encourage our participants. Okay, so we have Orest uh, raising his hand, and so please, Orest, uh, jump in. Everyone, do you hear me well? Yes. Thank you. It's a big pleasure to be here with all of you. And uh, unfortunately, I was late. And it's great to see Jana here. And I remember when Jana was in Lviv, helped us to establish the Center of Trauma Therapy in the Catholic University. And it was a nice presentation, but uh, I had some few thoughts during the, your presentation. And we all are talking about promotion, prevention, and this is the general issue that we are trying to promote as a society in general. But journalists, as also as a medical doctors, they are maybe also like more, uh, more in, a, in their professional life, they are more um, capable Expose. to meet some traumatic, traumatic events. And here we have to have like particular attention to them and normalization is one of the issue, but also I think the important 
issue could be when we are trying do you hear me yeah, yes yes okay because some the, the loss of connection i think that also like uh, could be possible or maybe have sense to look at the journalist as the first responders when we are talking and working as a fireman or some some policemen or military service because they are like in the front line of the emergency mostly of the their activities especially in the war time so and try to keep the, the approach to promote the mental health service and mental health self-care to them so this could be with these people and thank you very much for this event irena very nice event and very good interesting presentation so thank you very much thank you orest yeah thank you for for your for your comment and joining us and uh, i would like with 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 that like to wrap up our meeting and to thank as well to our translators andri tamarina yeah uh, thank you very much. And yeah, just a short story Lana told us before the meeting that actually sometimes translators could be exposed by the content of, of the discussion as well. Yeah, so let's... Take... <laughs> uh, hopefully not, <laughs> but uh, let's take care. Uh, yeah, and uh, good luck uh, and see you in two weeks.